I'm thankful that God put a spirit in me that hungers and thirsts after him. That tonight I'm on loan to you from the Hurricane Nazarene Church. I think everybody should have a home church that they are fully committed to, to do their ministry. And I'm here on my pastor's permission, just so you'll know. But I am glad to be here tonight. I'm among friends, and I'm among Facebook friends, and I've got to know Pastor Tim more through Facebook than anyhow. Uh, but I'm glad to be here with you tonight and glad to bring you the word that the Lord has given to me. When uh, Pastor Tim contacted me, I was excited in my spirit. It didn't work out the last time we were going to try to get together. My schedule was off, and, and so I was excited to get to come back, Pastor Tim, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that I felt the Spirit of the Lord deal with me about the message tonight. You see, I don't want to be an old donkey just baying in the wind, but I want to be a servant of the Most High God, anointed in the power of the Holy Ghost to speak what thus saith the Word of the Lord and how He wants it said while we're here. I believe He knew who was going to be here tonight. I believe He knew what you needed. I believe He knew what I needed. And I believe if we're obedient tonight, we can go away rich in the blessings of God. Amen? Man, I tell you, I feel the preacher man already, but I've learned to not get in a big hurry and to just wait on the Lord. I, I really enjoyed what Pastor brought to us and, and how important it is for us to understand the church has probably killed and run more people off out of the church than anybody else. Can I get an amen from somebody? We get into the silliest things in doctrines and isms and schisms, and we drive people away from the house of God when he made it clear tonight we ought to be witnesses of Jesus, and we ought to be able to say with boldness and proudness, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was bound for a devil's hell, but tonight I'm on my way to heaven. If my heart should stop beating within my chest this very evening, I'll go to be in the presence of the Lord. If that ain't exciting news, honey, you can't be excited. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm glad my foot's on the rock, and it may slip every now and then over me, but he said it was a firm foundation that I could stand on, that when the winds and the waves come blowing my way, I could still stand, amen, glory to God. I'm glad for salvation, I'm telling you. I'm glad that one day he picked me up out of the old miry clay, and, and he cleaned me up, and he set me on that rock. But I want to tell you, there have been those times I've had to go back and get right again. Can I get an amen from anybody? You know, we got a lot of people believing that they can't be good enough to be Christians. Guess what? They can't be. But the blood of Jesus can wash away the sin and cause us to be justified, sanctified, and glorified to be able to sit in heavenly places. That I can come, you can come boldly into the throne room of grace and find an ever-present help in the time of need. That's the word of God, is it not? Well, that's not what I'm going to preach tonight. I just feel the preaching man tonight. How's that? Woo! That feels good. I tell you, we ought to do a little more shouting. We got every reason to be excited, every reason to be happy. We've got every reason to be joyful. Amen. Woo! I'm going to try to get to Nehemiah chapter 8 here just in a minute. If you want to try to get there with me, that'll be fine. Nehemiah chapter 8. Now, I'm going to read little bits at a time of all 18 verses of the 8th chapter. Before we get into that, though, I want to just kind of give you a little bit of heads up. Most of your Bible scholars, you already know this, but I just got to lay the groundwork a little bit. There was a man named Ezra who went back to the destroyed city of Judah. The walls had been broken down. The houses and the buildings and the temple had been destroyed. Why? Because God told them. He said, in the day that you turn from me, 
My blessings will not be with you. And God is long-suffering. How many knows God's long-suffering? Can I get an amen from somebody? God is long-suffering. But if you continue in sin, there has to be a cost for that sin. Amen? And Judah had been destroyed, and they had been in captivity. And uh, so 14 years before uh, Nehemiah here, Ezra goes back, and he's starting to be the minister of the word. He finds the scrolls and he begins to read to them the word of God. And he begins to try to do what he can to bring spirituality back inside those broken walls. How many know today we need a man of God who will stand inside our broken walls and preach what thus saith the word of the Lord. You don't need my doctrine. You don't need my isms and schisms. You need what thus saith the word of the Lord. We've got guys that are doing every kind of thing to try to entertain people to get to church, and people still ain't coming to church. But honey, when you set them on fire with the word of God, they'll come to the house of God. Amen. 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 So Ezra's there doing work. Nehemiah happens to be the cupbearer for, um, let me get this name right, Artaxerxes, the king who is the captive king who's in control. How many knows that you can be blessed even when you're oppressed? Oh, wait a minute. Y'all went too light on me. How many knows you can be blessed when you're oppressed? Amen. Let me tell you, in the last 12 months, I buried my hero, my grandfather, almost 100 years old, one of the greatest preachers in the world. I buried my mother. I buried my stepfather. I buried friends. But I want to tell you the joy of the Lord is still my strength. Amen. Because i tell you this. I'm going to heaven. Amen. I'm going to heaven. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against us that are the church of the living God. Amen. Amen. Chapter 8, Nehemiah, if we could read just a little bit. Now remember, Ezra's already been there. Ezra's already doing a spiritual work. But God has set Nehemiah in a place of opportunity. Now, I want to ask you tonight, before I go any farther, do you believe that one man, one woman, can make a difference? Do you believe that? You have an example in your church. You have many examples in your church, but I'm going to embarrass her just a little bit. Missy Cochran sometimes sets my soul on fire with her post on Facebook. Sometimes I have to go to my knees and start praying and praising God. It takes just a little bit of faith to make a difference in people. One person can make a difference. Don't you ever get discouraged in what you're doing for the kingdom of God. Don't you ever think you're not big enough to make a difference. We all can be used God, by God for His glory and for His honor. In chapter 8, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. All of this is happening. All of this is happening because one man, Nehemiah, was set in power before Artaxerxes, uh, Xerxes and is able to get a release to start rebuilding the wall, the wall of the city. Not only does he get the release, but he gets the finances. How many do you know that the Lord will cause the enemy to cause you to have increase to do good for the kingdom of God? Do you know that if God will, if we will be submissive to what it is God wants to do in our lives, he will give us blessings from the strangest places to be used for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. So here this cupbearer, Nehemiah, has been before the king, and he's weeping. Why is he weeping? Because the Lord's moved on his spirit to cause him to weep. And he's weeping before the king. Now the cupbearer, you have to understand the importance of the cupbearer. The cupbearer is the difference between the king living and dying. 
because back then they were so bad about the opposition to put poison in the king's drink and to kill him. So the cupbearer made sure what the king was drinking was good, even to the point that sometimes the cupbearer was requested to drink the first drink of it that the king would know that it was good for him to drink from. And there was a relationship built there. When somebody's got your back, you build a relationship, right? And so Nehemiah has built a, a relationship with king, and so he asked him why he's weeping. And he said, well, I have to be honest with you, king. He said, my people are sitting in ruin, and they're not able to even live in their houses in good condition. And I'm hurting for my people, and the king give him favor. And so he goes back, and if you read uh, chapters 1 through 7, you know already that they go back, and Nehemiah is very much aware of his enemies in, in the area, and so he begins to examine the wall around Judah, and he begins to see what needs to be repaired. And I want to tell you, it looked big. The repair that needed done was great, but how many knows little is much if God is in it? And Nehemiah believed God had set him in place, in power, and given finances even of the captive king to rebuild the wall. It takes one man to light a fire. And when you light a fire, you draw a crowd. Nehemiah began to draw a crowd. And you can go through the names of all the people that started joining up with Nehemiah, and they begin to do people repaired the wall right in front of their house. Some people were repaired at a thousand uh, feet down the street from where their house was. But they all begin to work together. Woo! Woo! Can I say that again? Yeah. They all began to work together. I would to God that we would understand that we have con con common concern, common issues, common truths, common values with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in churches everywhere that are Christian churches. Hmm. Give you some quick history if you don't know. Born Free Will Baptist. Saved and married into the church of God. Called into the ministry to teach and preach in the church of God. God called me to preach and then to pastor at a first church of Christ in Chapmanville. After that all uh, fell apart because of the coal job and everything, I, I drove from Charleston to there for three and a half years before God gave me a release. I couldn't leave till God gave me the release. Then I went to a church of God in, that, in, the, in Taste Valley, there for a short time, and God put me on the move. And I said, God, I'll be honest with you, I said, God, I'm tired of moving. I'm tired of changing church. I'm tired of learning new people's names. But I want to tell you something. When I walked into that church, the first church of the Nazarene at Hurricane, when I walked into that church on a Wednesday night, Renee and I both knew in short order it was where God had called us to. So if you want to put a label on me, I'm a Baptist, Church of God, Church of Christ, Church of God, Nazarene. But if you want the label that I am, I am a born-again child of God, and I have commonality with the Methodist, I have commonality with the Presbyterian, I have commonality with all those who believe and confess Jesus Christ as Lord. They started working together. Can you imagine the increase we would have in our churches if we began to work together? I, I'm going to get back to eight, but hold on just a little bit. Do you remember when we used to have community revival that churches came and supported other churches' revivals? I do. I remember a little church down on the, on the end of the hall down there called Green Branch. And, honey, they'd have six-week revivals. The church would be full. They'd be lined wall to wall, hanging in through the roll-out windows, and people come from other churches and got behind the revival. What happened? God began to give the increase and save, save souls and added to the church as he saw fit. But after a while, doctrine started dividing us. Is it okay? Is it all right? Is it all right? Doctrine started, well, I, I don't believe in anointing with oil. I, I, I don't believe in baptism in water. I, I don't believe in this and I don't believe in that. 
Can we come back to the common stuff? Can we come back to the fact that I once was lost and now I'm found? Can we get back to the fact that Jesus hung on the cross for the Nazarene just like he did the Methodist, just like he did the Baptist, just like he did that bar dweller that needs to be saved? And if we'll start working together instead of against each other, the Spirit of God will start to move in our churches again and we'll see a refreshing. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that with all my heart. If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't tell you that. Nehemiah got the people working together again. There was enemies that came and kind of teased him a little bit. You'll never be able to build this wall back. You'll never be able to put it all together. It'll never be a safe place again. It'll never be what the foxes will just jump up on the wall and the wall will crumble. But Nehemiah didn't listen to the enemy. The enemy is telling a lot of pastors, a lot of congregations today that the day of the church is over. That's what the enemy's saying. Come on now. That's what he's saying. Come on. I, I see your sign over here. I supported 110%. God, help us to build our Sunday schools again to start birthing our young people in the knowledge of the Word so when they get old enough to think for themselves, they can read the Word of God for themselves and they can be like you are, saved, born-again Christian. But if they see us struggling and pulling and, and, oh, God, help me tonight, even in our own sanctuaries, coming against each other instead of coming together, some that were building the wall were probably aged. And they probably couldn't do much more than fix the wall in front of their house. But they fixed the wall in front of their house. Some were a little younger, a little healthier, a little more skilled, and they built it, for, rebuilt it for a long distance. After a while, when the wall started coming together, the enemy come back again and said, I want to meet with you, Nehemiah. Remember what Nehemiah said? He said, I'm on a wall doing a work, and I can't come down. We've got to quit listening to the voice of the devil and the invitations he brings to us because all he's wanting to do is he's wanting to stop you from the progress that you are making. Huh? And finally, in 53 days, I believe it was, the wall was totally restored. The gates were all fully set in to the gate of the wall but they were protective and they had their city back under control why because they were working together I'm going to brag on my home church a little bit because I can brag on this church as well what y'all doing here is great you got young people singing you got the older people still actively involved in your singing stuff at our church we have like 34 special singers you only get to sing about once ever month and a half at our church, sometimes maybe two months before we get to sing. But guess what? They're from this height to this height, from a young age to older than my age. But they're working and pulling together. Now granted, I come from a more populous area and there's a little more people to pull from. But you know what? You can do what you can do in your area. A lot of people are getting discouraged. They're starting to give up and they're starting to the churches are starting to die off. But can one make a difference? Chapter 8, verse 2. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. Wait a minute. This guy's reading from the Word from morning to midday. Can I be honest? I don't think we give enough time to the Word. I'll go ahead and put my hand up. I don't give, I don't give all the time to the Word I should. If you're honest, most of you don't give enough time to the Word. Sometimes I don't give enough time to praying. I'm going to tell you, Renee's better at reading the Word, and I'm better at praying. So I hope she's pulling one end of the rope and I'm pulling the other in the same direction. But I want to tell you it's important that we realize what we do is important. 
Tonight, Paul's at home. He hasn't been able to come to church for three weeks. I miss him up in that sound booth. That's not anything against the gentleman up there in the sound booth, but I'm telling you, I'm, what's that? You miss him too. But those jobs, those roles are important. You think because you maybe sit on a pew and, and you don't do anything up here on the stage, you're not important? You're very important. Tonight when I come through the door, people who are sitting on pews come and shook my hand, told me they loved me, told me they missed me. You know what that did? That pumped me up and encouraged me. Can you imagine if we got more regular about inviting people in and encouraging them when they got here, how our church would grow? And he read therein, before the street that was before the water gate, from morning until midday, before the men and women and those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive under the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, now I want you to catch this next line, which they had made for the purpose. They wanted a place for the anointed man of God to be able to stand and read to them the word of God. It's important that we get behind the anointed man or woman of God. It is so important. You know what? If someone is willing to take on the challenge of being your pastor, honey, you need to be lifting them up. You need to be praying for them. You need to be encouraging them. And then you need to go back again and pray for them. But you know what happens after, oh, God help me tonight. We get familiar. Huh? Huh? Come on, Tim, is it okay? We get familiar, and it's kind of like, well, Tim will preach this, or he'll preach that, or, or, or you know, I, I really didn't like the way Tim preached last Sunday. Did you pray for him when you went home? Instead of talk about him. And I'm sure you do good preaching every time. I'm not saying you don't. You know why churches struggle to keep pastors anymore? It's because the church will not lift them up before God. I'm telling you, you ought, you, ought, you ought to pay them the workman's worthy of their hire. You ought, you ought to honor their position or whatever. But the most important thing you can do is lift your pastor up continually before the throne of God. Now, I just come out of revival at our church, and Dr. Nelson Perdue was there, and I'm going to tell you every night Bill Runyon was sitting up on the edge of his seat. He was a 77-year-old man who was very knowledgeable in the Word and very anointed. But I'm going to tell you, a couple weeks ago, we had a young new preacher in our church, 18 years of age, and he got up and he preached with good anointing and a good message. You know why? Because he's got people in the church who are praying for him. You know why the evangelists preached good? Because we've been praying for revival, just like y'all been praying for revival. And when you feel like I can't pray, that's when you need to pray the most. Amen. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattiah, and Shema, and Anaiah, and Urijah, and Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand, and on his left hand, Pediah, and Mishael, and Micah, and Hashem, and Heshbandana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Now those were tough names for me. When I was studying that, you know what the Holy Spirit brought to me? Some of those guys might have been his friends. Some of them might have been his family. In fact, if you go back and look, some of them were his family. But some of them might have been those who didn't support him or stand with him whenever their nation was in struggle. Huh? We don't always all agree on everything. Huh? We don't always agree on everything. We may not agree on the same brand of car, we may not even agree on the same kind of clothes. We might not agree on the same kind of food. But, honey, we ought to agree together when we come to the house of God that what is important in the house of God is that we are of one mind and one accord lifting up the name of Jesus. And this is happening here because they've suffered because of disobedience. They've suffered because of backstabbing, cutting throats not being supportive. Yeah, how can you say that? The Holy Spirit told me to tell you that. How can I say that?
Do you know our nation is so divided right now by every kind of issue that you can imagine? Birth, sex, versus identification, he said. In my lifetime, in my whole lifetime, I never thought we would ever argue that. I thought it was defined from the two cells coming together. It was defined, but we argue that. We argue skin color. We argue skin favoritism. We argue politics. We argue this. We argue that. And we keep being divided. And a house divided cannot stand, nor can the house of God stand divided. Woo, I'm glad he didn't get into politics tonight, all right? Huh? You see, I don't think the day of the church is over. As a matter of fact, it aggravates me sometimes when I hear people say, well, the church is dying. Honey, if the church is dying, it may be dying at your house, but it ain't dying at my house. I'm telling you right now, I can go to my knees in my living room. I can sometimes be getting in the shower, getting ready to go to church Sunday morning, and the presence of God begins to fall in my house. Sometimes Renee just has to step off to the side and get out of the way, and sometimes she joins me. But I want to tell you, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that he's alive and his kingdom's alive and well. And if you want to get under my skin quick, start telling me the church is dying. Glory to God, somebody would say that. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Woo! It wasn't too important before them walls come down. But how did after them walls was broken and their houses was burned and they were taken away in captivity, that word of God got important to them. I'm going to tell you it's going to get important again in this nation. You take my word for it. It's going to get important again. What your pastor brought to you tonight is factual numbers and the fact of it is our nation is not a nation of Christians. Huh? I, I, I didn't say the church was dead. I said our nation is not a nation of Christians. A lot of people got mad at Barack Obama when he said that, but you know what? When you look at the numbers, he's right. I hate to say he's right, but he's right. We're not a Christian nation no more. When 80% of your nation won't darken the doors of the church, we're not a Christian nation. When we start persecuting the Christians and start pushing the Christians aside, we're not a Christian nation. But I want to tell you, the church of the living God is still alive and quite well. He's, in, he's alive in you. He's alive in your sanctuary. He's alive in me. He's alive in the sanctuaries I go to. I'm excited when I get to come back into the Logan County area to preach because there are still people who are still a church on fire ignited about the blessings of God. Whoo. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. Oh, can I stop there a minute, please? Can I please stop there just a minute? Back when I was a kid going to church at Lamble Free Will Baptist Church, honey, there's a little lady there. called Her name was Effie McDaniels. And her and my grandma... When the Spirit of God would start moving into Free Will Baptist, Effie would start doing a little number like this right here, and she'd be going around, Woo! Praise the Lord! She had something. My granny, I didn't know my granny had knee length hair until one night when she was a shouting in the church and all them bobby pins come out and it dropped down in the back. We need to be bold in the Spirit of God. We need to take off those shackles that have us bound. And worship God in spirit and in truth. Woo! With the lifting up of their... Oh, God, okay. How many of you... Don't raise your hand. Just, just, just know that this one's for you. How many of you sometimes are sitting in church, good songs being sung, a good message is being preached, and the Holy Spirit says, won't you just raise your hand up about right here? Huh? Come on. Come on. You know what I'm saying? You know where I'm going. And it's kind of like, well, I, 
I really don't feel that way today. Honey, until you raise that hand, you won't feel that way. If the Holy Spirit's having you to raise that hand, raise it. You know what will happen when you raise it that high? All of a sudden, you'll see that one go up. And then you can't get them high enough, and it's kind of like this. And then you start that percolating stuff. Woo! Woo! Kind of like Sally does. Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Are you ashamed to shout anymore? Huh? We need to be excited about what it is we got. Lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads. And we did say revival was for the church, didn't we? Woo! They bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Woo! I just got to do it, Pastor. begin to worship God not not ashamed of who they were not ashamed of what it was God was doing they knew they'd been in a bad place but God was beginning to restore if we begin to shake off those things that have us bound we can see God moving in places again Woo. Woo. glory to God hallelujah I'm born again honey Woo. My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I gotta find my glasses or I can't read. Also, Jeshua and Bani and Sarabai, Jamin, Acob, Shabbatai, Hodajah, Masaiah, Kelita, Zira, Josabad, Hanan, Hileah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place let me stop there just a minute if i can we're living in a nation today that very people have a clue who noah really is we're living in a nation today where people most people don't really know who moses is why because we are at the third and fourth generation of godlessness don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. I'm going to tell you that. Three generations ago, moms and dad, oh, God help me. I'm going to preach it. Three and four generations ago, mom and dad determined it wasn't important for their kid to go to Sunday school no more. Huh? Oh, don't get mad at me. I'm going to preach it. Huh? Come on. That's okay, honey. You can stay at the house. There ain't no problem. Well, there is a problem. It's just being planted, but it's going to grow into a tree of thorns, not a tree of fruit. Two generations ago, mom and dad didn't go to church no more. One generation ago, grand oh, God help me tonight. Grandma, great-grandma is trying to raise the kids. They think they ain't got time to take the kids to church, and we're still not getting them to church. And we wonder why we're battling the things we are. We're battling the things we are because we've turned our back on the Word of God, and we've turned our back on the first order of parenting, and that is this, that we should raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's happening here is these Levites are starting to instruct these people of the things they didn't know. Honey, if there's ever a time you need to be praying for Sunday school, it's now. I'm going to tell you, a lot of churches that I visit and go to, their Sunday school rooms are storage rooms. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Huh? They, 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 they've, got, they've got the chicken picking tables over in the Sunday school room, so when they decide they want to have a chicken picking or a pig picking, They'll pull them out of the Sunday school room and, and set them up and they'll have a big eat. And, and there'll be all kinds of people come and eat the pig, eat the chicken, whatever. But, honey, they won't come back and darken the door. Why? Because, honey, we got that Sunday school room full of tables and chairs, and we aren't getting them kids from the point of birth up. I'm not bragging. I'm just stating facts. I've got an 18-month granddaughter, 18-month-old. Month, 18 month we tell her about Jesus. Oh, Bill, does she really understand it? Well, let me tell you how much she understands it. She comes over to the cell phone, and she has us to hit Mamaw singing. 
And when Mamaw's a singing on that video on, on the phone, she starts doing this and raising her hands. Why does she do that? I'm glad you asked. Because she sees Papa and Mamma at church. She sees Daddy and Mommy at church. The tears running down her eyes. The praise going up. She's seeing the example of Jesus living in us. Got to do it. God, I, I promise you, I'm not being mean tonight. I'm just pouring it out as the Holy Ghost gives it to me. Amen. So they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly, and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. The Bible says that the older should teach the younger. It is important that we do that. And Nehemiah, verse 9, we're changing gears here just a little bit. And Nehemiah, which is the Tarshish, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Have you ever weeped at the preaching of the word of God? Some of the, I, I get excited about good music as good as anybody. I've played music all my life. I love good songs with good, powerful words and stuff like that. But honey, when I'm sitting on my seat and I'm hearing the anointed, preached Word of God, it is almost made flesh in front of me again as the preacher preaches that Word because He is the Word. The Word is Him. And we need the knowledge of that word. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Well, I got to do it. Do you know the difference between a testimony and whining? Huh? 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 A testimony only, hear me, a testimony only glorifies God. Come on. Come on. God help us. When we get up and for five minutes glorify all the things the devil has done to us. God help us. God help us. Honey, I've had a bad week this past week during the middle of a great revival. I don't need to tell you what the devil did to whoop me because I enjoyed the Lord. I'm going to tell you how good I enjoyed the Lord this week. Huh? Huh? My bus broke down three times this week. If you ever a bus driver, you know that's a bad day. But the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen? You know, when we go... Oh, Lord, be easy on me tonight. Do you know when we go out and talk about our church out in public, we are crucifying Christ because this is His church. When we start talking negative about things going on in our church, we are blacking the eye of Jesus because this is His church. This church is filled with your brothers and your sisters. And I'm telling you, I fought with my brothers and sisters at home growing up. But honey, if somebody come against them outside of mommy and daddy's door, I was lined up with brother and sister and I was defending. We need to stand with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Hallelujah. So the Levites stealed all the people, saying, Hold your peace. For the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. We've got five verses to go. Six. And on the second day, 
They were gathered together, the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. And that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of thick trees to make booths, as it is written. What are they doing? They're returning back to the old path. They're returning back to what they were supposed to be doing all along. They had built fine houses. Do you remember? They were building fine houses. And they were neglecting the things of God. And so after they've heard the law and they've heard the word here, they start building these booths on top of their house. What's the purpose of the booths? I'm glad you asked. That it made everybody equally the same. Huh? Huh? I'm no, imp no more important in the kingdom of God than you are. You're no more important in the kingdom of God than pastor. Pastor's no more important in the kingdom of God than anybody in this church. Pastor that well, I sit under for many years said the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Do you know the best way that the devil slips in as he, as he starts letting us uh, enjoy our blessings and we start getting prideful and we start thinking we're something because, hey, I drive a Tahoe. You only drive an estate. I, I, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Let's get down to where it's at. I've got six zeros on my bank account with a number in front of it, and you've got zeros in your bank account. That's what happens. Pride moves in. And we start elevating ourselves. And he said, you need to go back and build these booths, and you need to get sincere in your worship. I mean, I don't care if you've got a zillion dollars or if you ain't got a penny. If you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, Amen. you've got everything you need. Amen? So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, every one upon the roof of his house and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the street of the water gate and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. And all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so. When I read that again, it amazed me. Not since the day of Joshua, the son of Nun, had they done that. And there was very great gladness. Can I stop there just a minute? I loved your testimony tonight, your confession. Do you know why a lot of churches have stopped communion? Because nobody will show up. Huh? Huh? Okay, maybe I'll have a good turnout. I don't know. But most churches, can I be honest? A lot of times I was invited to preach communion services because the pastor was, oh, help me, Lord, going out of town. He knew nobody was going to be there, so let's get another preacher in to cover. It happened. It really happened. What are we doing? We drop those things. Jesus said, do them often in remembrance of me. Huh? Now, that doesn't mean we do it every Sunday because then it begins to be worthless. But, honey, when you get to where you only do communion once a year, once every two years, or you just stop doing it, period, you're dropping the standards of what Jesus told us to do. I know we live in a day when people are peculiar about funny things, but foot worship. Did he not tell us to wash our brother and sister's feet? Huh? Huh? Do you know I go to churches where they haven't done foot washings in years? I wonder what would happen if they break the bowls out and start washing one another's feet. I wonder what would happen if before they did that they would have communion and weep before the altars of God and get pure and understand what communion's all about. These things are important or Jesus wouldn't have directed us to do so. Huh? Also, day by day, from the first day until the last day, he read in the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the manner. I 
I once was a young man. And I saw great moves of God in churches. And I saw faithfulness in those churches. I saw and heard the shouts. I watched them run the aisles. And honey, those people wouldn't have done that within themselves for anything. They were honorable, good, praying, hardworking Christians. But you know, I don't see that as much anymore. Don't, don't get mad at me, but I don't see that much, so much anymore. I hear people talking about how I wish things were like they used to be. They can be. They can be. But we need to return to those things that God said we need to do. We need to realize how special it is, what opportunity we've got. If I drive between here and Putnam County, I can drive by churches tonight who had the lights turned off. No Sunday night service. Don't Please, if I step on your toes, don't get mad. I'm old-fashioned. I can't help it. I drive by churches where there's three or four cars in the parking lot. And I used to go to those churches on Sunday night services, and the parking lot was full. What changed? God didn't change. Huh? The people changed. I wish you'd ease up on me just a little bit. I'm being honest before you. If we're going to see a turn in this nation, if we're going to see our churches be the church of the living God again, we're going to have to go back to the old past. We're going to have to go back to the things that we know we're supposed to do. It's not that we don't know that we need to do them. We just We know we should read the Bible every day. Is that a question? No. We know we should pray every day. That's not a question. We know we ought to have communion. We know we ought to have revivals. And don't get mad at me. But honey, I went to two-week revivals when I was a kid growing up. Huh? Now, I know work schedules were different then. Don't get me wrong. But let me ask you, when they nailed him to the cross, is it worth your commitment to support your church's revival more than Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night? Ooh, God. Huh? Is it worth you coming to choir pra- I know I'm probably going to, I know I'm going to step on some toes, but I can't help it. Is it, was the love that Jesus had for us worth going to choir practice was it worth saying i'll teach a sunday school i'll push until sunday school happens is it worth studying the word of god and maybe being called to preach or help you lord pastor somewhere revival is for the church we in the church i'm not picking on claypool i'm talking about the church we need a revival in America. When 49%, I believe you said, said, I'll go back to church when somebody invites me. God help you, you ain't inviting somebody to church. Woo. Now we can take this back home and we can just let it go. Say, oh, Bill, he was really revved up Sunday night. Or we can take these things that God told me to bring. He's not thumping on y'all. I'm not thumping on y'all. If we want to see the revival that needs to happen in our churches, honey, I don't care what the name brand is over the door. If we're blood-bought by Jesus, we need a revival. I'm going I'm to throw something. I promise I'm going I'm to stop here just a minute. I can drive through Putnam County, through Hurricane through Taze Valley. I can go over to Winfield on Sunday night and there's no Sunday night church services. God help us. When it gets to where that pig skin is more important than being in the house of God, honey, we got our priorities all wrong. When it gets to where soccer and volleyball is more important than Wednesday night service, we've got our priorities wrong. God 
shake us. Come shake me. I, I consider myself pretty faithful to church. I rarely miss a church service. But in what spirit do I go? Do I go in the spirit of obligation? Or do I go in the spirit of love and commitment to El Shaddai? Why do I go? If we were to ask ourselves, why do I go to church? I'm afraid a lot of people say, well, because I like Krista, because I like Larry, because I like Pastor Tim. It's supposed to be about God and loving God. I'm preaching to good people here tonight, but we all need to shape ourselves and stir ourselves because I'm telling you, we in this nation, we are in trouble. I'm not prophesying to you. You can turn your TV on, and if you got any kind of donkey sense, you can understand our nation's in a mess. But I believe in all my heart, if we'll fall upon our knees and call upon the name of the Lord and we'll repent, I believe God can bring a revival not only to this church, not only to other churches, but to this nation. Yes. God put us Christians in our Washington offices again. Yes. We probably ain't had one of them in a long time. I'm not worried about me. I'm saved, and I know I'm saved. I, I'm not even worried about Renee. I'm not worried about my daughter. And I'm not really worried about my son-in-law because I'm telling you what, he's a wonderful man and, and, and I believe he loves the Lord and he serves the Lord. But I've got an 18-month-old granddaughter. You've got grandchildren. Some of you have got children. And they're going, oh, God, help me, please. They're going to schools where they're being taught godless things. They're going to colleges where they're being, and they have been being taught godless things. If we're going to turn this nation around, it ain't going to be a Republican, a Democrat, a white or a black. It's going to be the blood of Jesus as we cry out. God bring revival to our nation. Shake our ball fields. Shake our gymnasiums. Move in the power of the Holy Ghost. Oh, Pastor, Pastor, I'm pouring it all out. I'm pouring it out. I'm, oh, I'm sick of what I'm seeing. It breaks my heart. If we're going to see a turnaround in this nation, it's got to be a return to God in the church, in the church, in the church. I'm going to open the altars. They've already been opened. But I'm going to challenge you tonight. Don't you worry about what nobody thinks now. Don't you worry about, and Pastor is not, I don't believe he's that kind of, don't worry about what Pastor thinks. Don't worry about what your good friend thinks. If you've been slacking in your life, revival comes to the church, right? If you've been slacking in your life, here's where you need to bring it. And you need to crucify it. If taking your kid to football practice is more important than bringing them to Sunday school, God help you. God help you. If your, God, if your girl being looking 18 years old and she's 12 years old riding on a float in a parade somewhere is more important than getting her to Sunday school, God help you. If we turn back to him, he's waiting on us. Go ahead, Christus.